So thank you, Scott, appreciate that. Our first presentation um, is titled Pedagogical Approaches to Neurodivergent Learners in STEM, uh, presented by Sarah Sanders Gardner and Marissa Hackett of Bellevue College. Sarah is the designer and director of Bellevue's nationally recognized Neurodiversity Navigators Program. And Marissa is the director of the Disability Resource Center. So I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, I am going to get right into the deck because we have a completely packed session for you. So let's do it. <laughs> Why, thank you for that, Sarah. <laughs> All right. I also want to turn on the chat so I can see it. One second. I cannot see the chat. Oh, there's the chat. Okay, thank you. All right, so yes, this is what we are learning, um, pedagogical approaches for neurodivergent learners. I am Sarah Sanders Gardner. My pronouns are they, them. Marissa? Hi, I'm Marissa Hackett, uh, she, her. I'm the director of the Disability Resource Center and faculty in our um, Disabled Students Navigating STEM program. Okay, here we go. So today we're gonna talk about terminology. Is there a definition for neurodiversity? Yes, there is. And we're going to talk about models, pedagogical approaches, and give you some tools. So let's get going. Terminology around neurodiversity. Um, first thing we want to talk about is the language that we use when we talk about disabled people and autistic people. There are two different main ways to refer. Um, and used to be people thought that person first was the only way to go, but now we know, and the um, American Psychological Association told us in 2015 that both are good. So let's look at this real quickly. Um, identity first is disabled, autistic. I am disabled, I am autistic, and that um, describes me. Uh, it includes disability as part of the person and embraces that disability as one of the many intersections of identity that makes up the person. Many autistic and otherwise disabled people prefer identity first language. The blind community, the deaf community are two large communities that embrace that. There is also person first language. I had to say it's awkward syntax because I was an English major in college. Um, it separates the disability from the person. And this is a reason why some people choose this language. They don't want that disability to define them. And they say, um, my disability doesn't define me. It shows a desire to be distant from disability. Many parents and professionals often prefer person person language, but so do many people with disabilities. The APA said, as I said, in 2015, Ask the preference of the disabled person themselves. And when you're doing presentations, writing papers, et cetera, you should use both interchangeably. And so there's a couple of symbols here. The one on the left is the rainbow neurodiversity infinity symbol, which is meant to um, represent the many different types of people, many different neurotypes, many different ways of being in the world that encompass our community. And then on the right is the probably more well-known Autism Speaks puzzle piece. I've put a do not use sign around it because many autistic people reject that puzzle piece. And in fact, research shows that there is a negative connotation between puzzle pieces and people. And so the community at large has asked people not to use that puzzle piece. So other things that we should avoid are euphemisms around disability language. So as you know, euphemism is a um, mild or indirect expression that is substituted for something that people think is too blunt or harsh or embarrassing. So people do this with the word disability quite a bit. Um, thank you, Martha and Natalia. Um, they say on the spectrum instead of on the autism spectrum, so they can avoid that word autism. They say challenged or differently abled or people of all abilities or special needs or disability with a capital A, or um, they make up words like disability and many, many, many other iterations. Again, disabled people get to say how they identify. So if a disabled person is using these terms, that's fine, no need to correct the person with the disability. However, non-disabled people should steer clear of these words because they land on us as microaggressions. So 
always defer to the preferences and language use of the person with the disability and how they identify. Disabled people own their identity. And this is very important. If you are not a member of the community, you do not get to put labels on that community. So speaking of that, let's talk about what is neurodiversity. This term was created by the autism community and it is defined by the autism community and many other people have tried to define it but there is one definition that was created by the person who created the word her name is judy singer she is an australian anthropologist who was born in hungary i've put a link when you have the deck you can go to the links at this blog judy describes exactly what she means by it i can only give you a very very brief information right now. So it came from the idea of biodiversity. And that's why I have this picture here that shows all these different creatures um, and plants. Biodiversity refers to every living thing, plants, bacteria, animals, humans. And sometimes it's in a particular reason or bio ecosystem, but sometimes it just refers to all living creatures. The term neurodiversity comes from that term biodiversity and is an expression of inter of from comes from intersectionality as well as one of the many variabilities that describe people. It's the virtually infinite neurocognitive variability within Earth's human population. So when you use the term neurodiverse, you are referring to all people. You are not referring to disabled people, you're referring to all people. This is a very important part of the neurodiversity movement that everyone has a different way of thinking. There is not one way and one wrong way or one different way. Everyone is neurodiverse. The term neurodivergent was also coined from the autism community by a multiply neurodivergent person living in the United States. Her na their name is Kasian Asamasu. And this is to signify an individual whose brain functions in ways that diverge significantly from dominant societal standards. Very different words, neurodiversity is a social movement, neurodivergent refers to a person. And then along with that term came the term neurotypical. So these are the definitions, this is where you can learn more about them. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, there are many things that fall under this neurodivergent umbrella. I'm not gonna go through them again because I gotta get through my time here. So here's a quote from Judy Singer. Neurodiversity is a property of the human population of Earth. While neurodiversity itself is just an indisputable fact about the planet, the neurodiversity movement is something else again. It's built on the idea that just as conserving biodiversity is necessary for a sustainable flourishing planet, so respecting neurodiversity is necessary for a sustainable flourishing human society. So we need all people, not just some people. So Marissa's gonna take it away. Thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the models of disability, which came from disabled communities um, in the 1980s originally and have been used in disability studies programs um, for a long time. To start out with the moral model, and I'm gonna start with, quote, the problem of disability. I'm not saying disability is a problem. It's not disability is rad, um, but there is like this idea in society that disability has a social problem associated with it. So the problem associated with disability when you're coming from the moral model of disability is this idea that there is a moral failing in your bloodline, from your ancestors, from your family line, um, from your parent, um, somewhere in there. And this is typically considered an older model, but it actually does show up currently. So anytime someone is trying to pray away a disability, that is them enacting the moral model. Um, the um, kind of thinking around um, when people said that autism was caused by quote refrigerator mothers or the mother being too cold to the child, that was the moral model. Thankfully that is pretty much kind of tapered out at this point. Um, and then things like telling chronically ill people, have you tried yoga is also the moral model where there's some sort of moral failing with the disabled person. Um, the medical model is our kind of typically most commonly used model in current US society where 
The problem of visibility is centered on the individual person with the idea that the medical industrial complex or the medical system is what can fix the disability um, and that that individual person needs to be fixed by medicine or some other medical, medical thing. Um, so the societal solution is to fix a person through the medical model. So still focuses on this idea of fixing disability and doesn't focus on disability as a normal part of our human diversity. Um, and this also, the medical model also reinforces cultural constraints around what is a typical or right way of being in the world, the, the right way to move your body, the right way to think, the right way to be in general, the right way to have feelings or emotions. Um, so then this brings us to the social model. The social model focuses from um, not on the individual, but on society and focuses the problem of societal, um, the societal problem of disability on how we can fix our um, built environment, our culture, our ways of teaching and learning to um, change the environment rather than change the individual person. Um, so in the social model, we would say instead of a deaf person can't go to the movies because they are deaf, we would say provide closed captions. So this is where we enter into um, accessibility, accommodations, um, and universal design to fix society rather than trying to fix the person. Um, and I, we're going to play just a couple minutes of this video. Do we have the sound turned on for video, Sarah? I'm just gonna look at the chat real quick um, while Sarah's sharing the video because there's some cool things happening in the chat too. Neurotypical isn't a bad word, but it makes neurotypical people feel uncomfortable to confront their privilege totally. Um, and then Jade said, sort of the same way cis people get grumpy when we say cisgender in conversations about gender. Yep, totally. Cisgender is not a bad word, neither is neurotypical. It just means fit into the norm that society wants you to fit into. So if you and I go to a building and there's no ramp, typically people think the problem is that we use wheelchairs, where a social model of disability would say, the problem is that the building's not accessible. And it doesn't seem like a radical concept, but it changes the fundamental way we think about disability and, and the work that we need to do to include people with disabilities. People often don't understand ability to be within this kind of uh, context and access to adaptive devices and where we are located economically. Um, you know, when I have my access needs met, I'm functionally not disabled, you know, but when places have stairs and everything is built for people that stand so I can't see anything and, you know, it's a really dark environment so I can't see anything, um, because you know, as you get older, your vision changes. <laughs> um, so now I need a lot of light to see things. In an environment like that, of course, I'm disabled. I really like separating out impairment from disability. So impairment as, you know, like physical or neurological manifestation, like what's real. I have a physical impairment. Mm -hmm. And then disability is like what society creates as barriers because of the impairment. So like, as you're saying, if we're in a place with where my access needs are getting met, then my impairment isn't so significant. Um, but when it's not because society doesn't want to, then that's a problem. So I think it's important to really think about like, disability and the context of what is disabling like the environment. The last building I worked in, it was really cool because um, it was universally designed. So all the doors had push buttons or they were like magically open you know as you walk up or everything is like automatically at my height and in that place I didn't need a lot of accommodations but then in an environment where it's not universally accessible where people with disabilities and parents and all types of folks weren't thought of in the design process 
um, that's when there's problems. Yeah, I'm not saying like it's easy to live with an impairment. It's not easy to live, you know, when you have like four kids. It's not easy to live when it's like 20 degrees outside. I mean, you know, for those of us in the Bay Area, like 55 is freezing. But, um, you know, I mean, there are times when it's just not convenient to have a body. But that's not what oppresses us. What oppresses us is living in a system which disregards us, is violent toward us, you know, essentially wants to uh, subjugate our bodies or kill us. Uh, that's oppressive. My body doesn't oppress me. My body, my body's fun. We can pause there. <laughs> Okay, so that was Stacy Melbourne Park, who was an amazing disability justice activist out of the Bay Area, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and then Patty Byrne, who I'm going to talk about now. Um, so Patty Byrne, along with other um, disabled, queer, and trans um, people of color, um, created the disability justice movement and model with these 10 principles of disability justice. So um, since the models were created in the 80s and are still really important, it's also important to kind of fast forward up to where we are now and think about um, moving beyond the social model and into disability justice. So the social model laid a really good groundwork for disability justice. Um, the 10 principles of disability justice are intersectionality, leadership of those most impacted, anti-capitalist politic, commitment to cross-movement organizing, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability, sorry, the solidarity, interdependence, collective actus, access, and collective liberation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about intersectionality, but I encourage you all to check out um, the website that talks about uh, the principles of disability justice more in depth. Um, Patty is an amazing activist and super important to learn from. So this is a quote from um, Patty Byrne. The first, a primary principle of disability justice is intersectionality. We know that each person has multiple community identifications and that each identity can be a site of privilege or oppression. The fulcrums of oppression shift depending upon the characteristics of any given institutional or interpersonal interaction the very understanding of disability experience itself being shaped by race, gender, class, gender expression, historical moment, relationship to colonization, and more. Um, we're gonna skip this video, but if you have a chance to take a look at it, it's, it's great, um, but it's best in its entirety. So we're gonna move forward in our short amount of time. Um, so, Basically, like with intersectionality, we want to be thinking about the role of power and privilege in any individual person's um, intersections of identities, and especially in our own when we are um, working with neurodivergent and disabled folks. Um, societal markers and lived realities determine access to resources. People who are perceived to um, be in privileged groups are rewarded for their group memberships, while others are disenfranchised and subject to regulation and violence. Um, and then that, that role of intersectionality. So someone may be perceived as having one specific identity because that's the most visible identity that they have. And there may be additional identities that you are not perceiving or identifying just by looking at or a first interaction with someone. You can go to the next slide, Sarah, because I think I'm talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries. Um, so just something to think about when we're thinking about like what we see when we're interacting with students and how to get to what else might be going on for that student, what other oppressions they might be experiencing that we're, we're not um, readily aware of in a first interaction or in our um, first perception of someone. So thinking about the student holistically, um, age, disability, religion, ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, indigenous backgrounds, national origin, gender, there are other identities as well. So just to be thinking about both how your identities play into what you're doing as well as what's going on for students when you're thinking about their identities. And we have these um, three pictures here, a transgender student, a um, student of color with a graduation gown and their colorful um, uh, 
I don't know what that's called, scarf on, and then a female presenting student. And they're all very different. And people may have certain thoughts about them when they see them and think they know them, but they don't necessarily. Okay, we're going to move on to pedagogical approaches. And we're going to look back at biodiversity. Uh, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. This is a quote by Ale Alexander Den Hayher. Don't know how to pronounce his last name. Apologies, Alexander. Uh, but we want to think about that biodiversity approach uh, in regards to neurodiversity, which is all the students in your classes, not only the neurodivergent ones. Uh, so let's take a look. The first thing I want to talk about is cultural expectations. And I'm going to use Edward T. Hall's cultural iceberg as a model to start with. So um, this is to help us understand that not everyone is communicating and behaving and understanding communication and behavior the same way. So Edward T. Hall uh, was a cultural anthropologist who specialized in nonverbal communication. And he said, when we think about a culture, we usually think about the surface culture, food, music, literature, language. But what really makes up a culture are these deep culture areas that a person has to live in the culture and learn through nonverbal observation. These are not didactically taught to people, nor really can they be because they're all flexible within that culture and in, then in other cultures. So things like communication styles and rules, facial expressions, eye contact, conversational patterns, handling, displaying emotions, tone of voice, notions of courtesy and manners, concepts of self, time and fairness, attitudes towards work and authority, approaches to religion, decision-making, problem-solving. There are potential conflicts in all of these areas, certainly between cultures. We all learned that back in Star Trek, the original generation. Um, but there are also potential for conflicts between people with nonverbal learning disabilities, which includes all autistic people and many other people when I first saw this slide, this um, concept, I was very excited because these are the areas where we get in trouble all the time, but so do lots of other people because people grow up differently. People absorb these concepts differently and they have different ideas around them. So if you think about, um, well, I guess I'm gonna share an example first and then I'll talk about that. So here's an example from my life. Um, in one house on the neighborhood, we were allowed, kids were allowed to jump on the sofa and swear. And in another house, a couple doors down, you were not allowed to do that or you'd get in a lot of trouble. So um, there were lots of different things where I would get in a lot of trouble. And so my parents decided I needed to learn some social skills. So they got someone to start teaching me social skills. What do you think? Put it in the chat, unmute yourself, shout it out. What do you think they taught me in social skills class about jumping on the sofa and swearing? Anybody? Never okay. No, never, no, okay. never do it. Never jump on the sofa and swear, exactly. So see this nice little person sitting on the sofa, all nice and calm. What did the other kids think about me after that? I got some names, stuck up, goody two shoes, teacher's pet. Don't play with Sarah. Sarah's gonna tell us the right way to do things. Right, exactly. So um, ever met an awkward autistic kid? They didn't get awkward by themselves. They got awkward by learning social skills. So there is a better way. We need to understand that cultural rules are flexible. And what someone with a nonverbal learning disability cannot do is see how these flex. We can't follow that. We don't see it. We don't notice it. We will never be able to see it. What we need to learn is self-advocacy. Someone needed to tell me, oh, Sarah, you just don't know when it's okay to do it and when it isn't. The other kids can see it, you can't, that's okay. That's just how you are. Ask the other kids, is this a house where we can jump on the sofa and swear? Or will you tell me when the parents are coming so I don't get in trouble? That would have been fine. I could have had friends, but no. Anyway, that is the danger of social skills classes. These rules are flexible. If you think about it, these rules are flexible in your friend groups, they're flexible in family groups, they're flexible in work teams, they're flexible in corporations or um, institutions, they're flexible in cities and states and countries, they're flexible everywhere. A typical person can flex with them. 
a person with neurodivergence often cannot. So you have some tools as faculty, as staff, as people who interact with neurodivergent people. First of all, if someone is communicating or, um, or uh, behaving in a way that is different from your cultural expectations in any of these areas, your first tool is most respectful interpretation, or as my students say, think the best of them. So think, why would a reasonable, kind person be doing or saying this, rather than, oh, that's so rude. Then use a tool called manage your stories. So um, if you still are telling yourself a story about why the person is doing it, ask a question. Are you angry with me? It seems like maybe you're angry. Um, could you say what you're doing, what, um, what you said again? I'm not sure I understood it. That, by the way, works really well if someone is purposely being mean to you. Just say, could you repeat that? Right? Um, repeat and reword your own statements. Uh, so say, I'm not sure what I said uh, came across clearly. Let me try to say it again. Also own your boundaries. Um, if someone's standing too close to you, for example, you don't need to teach them about personal space. Simply say, I need a little more space. I'm gonna move over here. You also don't need to teach them how to handle their emotions. If you're triggered by someone um, ramping up or getting loud, you can simply say, I'm gonna go get a drink of water. I'll be back in a few minutes. You don't need to add when you've calmed down, right? You just need to take care of your own self and then also teach self-advocacy. So this is everything in included in nonverbal communication, facial expressions, body language, eye gaze, appearance, how we use our sense of humor. The important thing to note with these things is research has shown not only do we not understand you, you don't understand us in these situations. You may think we're angry when we're not, you may not understand our sense of humor. You may not understand if a student is slumping down like this. It may be because they have low body tone, not because they're not interested. This also includes unspoken, implied, or hidden meaning within spoken communication. So needing to read between the lines, not saying what you mean because you want to be kind. Um, Brene Brown says clear is kind, unclear is unkind. You don't have to change all of your communication if you don't want to, but if someone isn't understanding what you're saying, add some more direct communication to it. Um, this varies between cultures and within cultures, but up to 85% of our communication can be nonverbal. And here we are, back to Marissa. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about universal design, but I think we've got a presentation coming up that's going to go much more in depth. So Generally, universal design is the idea that we want to um, set things up for every body and mind um, in mind. So um, when we're talking about physical space, that's ramps, etc. cetera. Um, but when we're talking about learning space, you go to the next slide. Do you want to describe, describe the picture for a second? Oh yeah, the, the picture that we um, have up is a brick building um, with a ramped walkway heading up to it with some folks walking and um, one person pushing a wheeled suitcase and another person, person pushing a wheeled barrel of sorts. Um, but it's a space where anyone could um, propel up depending on what mode they're using. Okay, so when we're talking about um, universal design for learning, um, the general premise is that we want to be engaging students in multiple ways, presenting information in multiple ways, so including visual, written, and pictures, and auditory, um, and then multiple ways of expression or assessment for everything. And we've got, um, a uh, wheel that says engage, express, and present information as the three main areas that you want to focus on um, providing multiple options for. Okay, and now 
Another tool that you can use is um, Tilt, Transparency in Learning and Teaching. And I am super excited about this as a brand new faculty because I have struggled with how do I make assignments really clear for students? Um, and this is a really great uh, way to do that. There are some great examples. You can easily look them up. Um, but the general premise is providing transparent information to students on the purpose, task, and criteria in an assignment or activity. Um, and there are transparent assignment templates online um, that have, you want to say the assignment name and the due date, the purpose, so what skills or knowledge is the student expected to get out of this assignment or activity, the tasks, so defining what specifically they're doing, and then the criteria for success. What does a well-done assignment look like with a specific grading rubric so that the students know how to get full points if they want that? And they can also choose to not get full points if they want to hit a C. So um, that is really helpful. And it looks like Natalie has a comment on it too. And people are putting links in the chat. Excellent. Okay, and then another um, great tool to use is both structure so making sure that you're providing structure so that students understand what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, um, what the expectations for them are. Um, it supports students in the understanding of why um, it's important to work through assignments regularly. So the understanding of how things build on each other, um, why you're doing one assignment before another, um, the amount of time and energy that they're putting into that, the amount of time and energy you're putting into it, and then the classmates' time and the energy. So everything is just very clearly laid out. But then it's also important to provide flexibility. So allowing for late work without penalty. So providing guidelines for when things should be turned in to be scaffolded and built on, upon each other, but allowing exceptions for that because there are always situations that students are going to run into, especially in our neurodivergent students where they may need more time to work on something, something may come up um, life-wise, there may be something in another class that's more urgent to do, and believing students when they have some sort of situation where they need flexibility, right? So um, instead of assuming everyone's giving a, the dog ate my homework reason, understanding that students have um, a large amount of things going on in their lives and we don't always know what those things are, so believing what they're telling us. And I just want to add a little bit to this page. Um, and that is that many faculty have moved away from traditional grading structures and moved to giving one point for every assignment or just a complete for the assignment. Um, and also allowing students to choose their grade at the beginning of the quarter, which indicates how many of the assignments from each category they're going to complete or to what level they're going to complete them. So these are all different ways to allow that flexibility as well. And then other practices. So making sure that you're using the student's name and pronoun and checking to make sure you're using the student's um, name that they actually go by, not just going by a roster that might be outdated. So there's lots of ways to do this, checking a Zoom name if you're on Zoom, asking students to tell you if they have a, a preferred name um, at the beginning of the quarter, um, asking students their pronouns, um, super important. And the image that we have up is um, uh, various different students with different pronouns on their uh, rainbow colored shirts, which is great. Um, some students have, some some of the figures have lighter skin, some have darker skin. There's um, someone with a head wrap or a turban, um, someone with an Afro. Um, so just an example that any different student um, could use a pronoun that you may not be expecting. It does not matter what the student looks like to you or how you're perceiving them. You have to ask someone's pronoun to know what it is. Um, meeting with students one-on-one, -on -one, so that one-on-one -on -one connection um, to make sure that you're building a strong relationship with them at the beginning, um, and then monitoring students' progress and intervening when students are not completing things, um, not showing up for class, et cetera. Many campuses have um, a place to send an early alert or report if a student is having a specific struggle. So that doesn't have to be all you as faculty in supporting, but the 
monitoring progress is really important because no one else is going to know what's going on with the student um, without that. Um, without that. And then I see that Sarah put in the chat um, that you don't need to do a round robin for pronouns where students are saying it out loud. So you can ask the question in a more private way, like have students turn it in on a four class survey or a first day of class um, in class assignment or um, something in your online learning system where they can indicate privately what pronoun they want used. Um, that can call out students who are trans and may not be out or comfortable sharing, and it um, can be uncomfortable for some students to do that round robin in class pronoun situation. Cool. Okay, now we're going to get to the tools. We have a few more minutes to go. Um, so we're going to talk about language and stress. Uh, and you have, we have all been in this situation where we have had a, a page to read that is just a page, a wall of text. And we've then also been in a situation where we have a page to read that has white space and pictures and bullet points. I know which one I would rather read. And so um, the first one is um, now has a new word in the dictionary, right? TLDR, too long, didn't read. So we're going to talk about how to support your students, all your students, in being able to access the language and your assignments and your emails and everything that you do. This is also for website use. It's plain language. It does not mean to use a certain level of vocabulary. It's written to your audience. So whoever your audience is, if they're college students, you should be using college level language. But it is a communication that's wording structure and design are so clear that the intended users can readily find what they need, understand it and use it rather than hiding what we mean within all the flowery words like people usually do. So here's an example before, and this is a typical thing that we see in emails, especially uh, written in the third person, the student applicant should be sure to be on time, submit an official copy of his or her transcript, never say that, the word they is very appropriate now, two letters of recommendation from professors, a statement of financial need, a short biographical statement to our grants office by April 15th. This is like a math problem to me, right? I have to circle everything I have to do, check them off in the little sentences. Afterwards, this is plain language, to apply, written right to the person, here's what you need to do, the deadline is right up front. Here's your checklist. I would probably even put little check boxes, right? And then where to send it. Um, you might even put more, but I ran out of space on my page. So plain language, much more accessible to all people. Um, and then also, and you can learn a lot more about that at the link that I put underneath the flowers on that page, also on our last page. Also, be sure to use your college's learning management system. I believe the UW also uses Canvas, which is what we use. Um, putting your materials into weekly modules is very helpful for students. They can see what they have to do each week. Um, if you don't have CD Labs already activated, ask your college, ask your e-learning department about CD Labs. It makes it helps you organize, but it also makes everything accessible to students as well. Um, so if you want to put how you're using Canvas in the chat to support other people who are here, that would be super helpful, I think, um, so that other people can see. I put everything in the weekly thing. I open up the week two weeks ahead of time. So students have a whole week to look through it. Some students like to organize themselves ahead of time and maybe even work ahead of time when they have are on a good streak, right? So um, it kind of just depends on how that person manages their disability. Okay, so then the last thing we wanna talk about, um, yeah, thank you, Jade. Yes, I wish we had that at our college. Um, the last thing we want to talk about is make sure that you are taking care of your own self and um, also using community care, not just self care. So we want to look at you putting on your mask first. And so it might be a beautiful mask like this. Um, we want to um, think about burnout and demoralization. They are two different things. 
And then making sure that you're taking breaks. We work a lot. And so you want to make sure. Um, oh, that's great, um, Diane. You should um, contact us about that. Uh, so your mask first. This is a picture of the early days when we used to wear cloth masks. Um, but really, it can re you know, that, that phrase used to refer to putting on your own oxygen mask first, right, in the airplane. Um, but we cannot support our students, we cannot support our friends, we cannot support anybody if we're not first taking care of our own selves. And um, this includes our whole community, reaching out for support, not just like, as Marissa mentioned, doing yoga, et cetera. You can't deep breathe your way out of a pandemic. You cannot stretch your way out of terrible class sizes. You can't individual behavior your way out of structural problems, right? This, it takes a community. It takes being in um, communion with others and um, really relying on other people and supporting them. So it, that whole interdependence um, piece that we've talked about. And um, ah, these are our discussion questions. So you're gonna go to discussion groups in about seven minutes, but I'm gonna stop sharing now. I'm gonna share the, um, there's our resources page. You're going to discuss what would you like to start doing based on what you've learned today? What would you like to stop doing that maybe is getting in the way of accessibility for neurodivergent students and all students? Um, and what are you already doing that's working well? And then what aha moments will inform your teaching going forward? So I'm gonna stop share. Um, we've got some great things in the discussion here. Um, Every task has a note about seeking support and the word finding support at the bottom of the page. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love that. Um, in Canvas, I have tasks that are not assignments. Yes, like readings. I add those to the task to-do list as well. Yes, that's a really great thing to do. Yes. Um, about three lessons a week, typical time. Yes, letting students know how long it will take to complete something is a really helpful thing. How long a video is, how long it might take to read something that you've assigned, um, a range of estimates, et cetera. Um, what else did I wanna say around that? Yes, using Tilt along with these things is super helpful. Um, Making sure your assignments are showing up on the Canvas calendar is also really helpful. Talking to your students at the beginning about how to use Canvas. Let's see what else we have here. And then also making sure that you're putting links in all your assignments to other material that they need to do that assignment. So not just saying, go find the blah, 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 put a link to it so they can do it. Thank you, Kayla, for putting that in there. I appreciate that. Um, look at you with your little check marks and everything. <laughs> that is so awesome. Thanks to Tammy for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah, I would say, this is Tammy, I would kudos you for restating what's in chat because if some of us need to get up and walk around, so we're on audio, but we're not being able to keep up with chat. It's nice when people restate what's being said. So thank you. Yeah. Um, anything with a due date comes up on the to-do list and you can add to the to-do list anything that doesn't already have a due date. Yeah, that's why the to-do list is really important to put a reading as a, as a student to do. Um, I found that telling students how long things take often causes anxiety. Okay, um, Brandon, that's an interesting point. Um, and yes, it would take more time to complete things with dyslexia. Marissa and I had this conversation because I said, we should put how long it takes to read this. And she's like, no, it might take someone twice as long. So um, maybe thinking about um, putting that range and then saying your mileage may vary or please take into account processing speeds or um, different things. Um, one thing I will say, Brandon, is I try not to assign things that are going to take longer than 15 minutes. 
So hopefully that's not causing anxiety. Hopefully that's relieving anxiety. I'm not going to ever assign something that takes an hour. Yes, redundancy of links is very important, Natalia. Yes, all the time. Just link every darn thing. Um, use Canvas at Oregon Coast Community College. Sort material by weekly modules, related discussion forums, reading assignment due date. Yep. And I use um, text headers to say like what category the things are in. Um, when I use Canvas, my announcements were all interlinked. So from email, they get the to-do list. Oh, can you do that? And yes, absolutely. It's an internal link in that in the hyper description block. If you go to links, you can select internal link or external link, and then you'll get a list on the side. And then you can just say, yes, I want this announce. I want this to go here. I want this to go here. I want this to go here. My students never clicked around. Like, no, I was just like, you will get no, this is organized well, but one of you will feel like you're lost. So just select it all from your email. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Would you like me to grab like a, a, a instruction? All right, I'll be right back. Thank you so much, Jade. Yay, you've helped many people because we'll take this back to our college too. Not to assume how long things take students are creating unreasonable expectations. Right. Um, don't tell us the training will take X hours and then wonder why it took three times as long. Yeah, true. Um, I agree, Natalia. Regarding nonverbal cues, is it important to describe what you are questioning? Instead um, of you seem really upset, say when you, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For clarification, I teach math. I assume it will take my students probably three times as long as me to complete a lecture. A lesson probably five to six times as long to complete homework. Yeah. So for some of these longer assignments, I would not put up how long I think it's going to take someone. I'm talking about if I put if I'm putting up like a 10 minute reading assignment, thank you so much, Jade. That is fantastic. Um, if I put up a 10 minute reading assignment or a 15 minute video, I'm going to tell them how long those things are. Um, but if I've got a whole you know, long thing. They've got to read a chapter in a book. I'm not going to tell them how long I think it's going to take them to read that chapter. I'm not going to tell them um, how long I think it's going to take them to do their math assignments. I may talk to them about um, starting to estimate their own speed so they can plan their time. It kind of depends on if I'm teaching a freshman course or uh, later in the in the year, but. As a suggestion, I walk students through creating their own task lists for the week, estimate time they think it will take. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's 10 o'clock. Um, with some cues for me, then assign task blocks. I provide blank weekly templates. Yeah, we do that in our program. Quizzes, exams, open book with no time limit. Yeah, that's great, yes. Yeah, for sure, um, um, Andy and Jan, when you're talking about a student who um, is looking like they are having a hard time in your class describing what you saw, for sure. Okay, we are done with our time, so we're going to let you go to your discussion groups, and thank you so much for having us. Right. Thank you so much, Sarah and Marissa. Appreciate all of that. Um, I think, you know, we could do a whole day on this topic, uh, for sure.